In this module, we're going to talk about everyone's favorite subject, knife skills. The objectives for this module include use knives safely, selecting care for knives, sharpen knives, grip and control knives when cutting food into a variety of classic shapes, identify classic knife cuts, and understand when to use the classic knife cuts. Some of the best advice I'd heard recently was from Chef Matsuhiro Moromoto, who said, a kitchen without a knife is not a kitchen. As you can see from this, there are lots of different styles of knife, from the bread slicer on the far end that has a serrated blade for slicing through the tough, crusty parts of the bread, to the ubiquitous chef's knife, which is going to be your best friend. And this one has a weird looking dimpled look to it, but chef's knife come in all different sizes, shapes, and styles. The paring knife is also gonna be one of your favorites. And the boning and cleaving knives at the end are going to be essential when dealing with fabrication of animals. Knives are the most commonly used tool in the kitchen and one of the most dangerous. For this reason, good knife skills are critical to a chef's success. Safety is always going to be paramount when dealing with knives and when dealing with safety in general in the kitchen. There are some specific rules when regarding safety in the kitchen. Use the correct knife for the task at hand. Don't use a paring knife when you need to use a peeler. Always cut on a clean cutting board. Never use glass, marble, or metal cutting boards. Place a damp towel underneath the cutting board to keep it from sliding around as you cut. Keep knives sharp. A dull knife is more dangerous than a sharp knife. When carrying a knife, hold it pointed down, parallel and close to your leg as you walk. A falling knife has no handle. Do not attempt to catch a falling knife. Step backward and allow it to fall. Never leave a knife in a sink of water. Anyone reaching into the sink could be injured or the knife could be dented by the pots and pans and other utensils. When washing your chef's knife after using it, uh, you want to start by using hot water and fill a container with some soap. And it's nice to sometimes use the uh, the grease cutting uh, style of dishwashing soap just because it helps uh, to get the gunk off your knife. Now, a lot of the times when I've cut myself in the past is when I'm actually washing my knife. Uh, so here you want to make sure that you're using a brush with an elevated handle and you're going to press the blade of your knife against the inside of your sink uh, scrubbing back and forth making sure that you get all the gunk off of both sides flipping the knife around and using you want to make sure that you're using a brush with soft bristles uh, nothing that's too harsh uh, because you will scrape off the coating of your knife which uh, isn't a good thing it could damage your blade Next, you want to rinse your knife under hot running water, get all the soap off, and even though you've washed your knife, you still need to sanitize it to make sure you're killing any bacteria that remains. And so you're going to just uh, lay your knife on a clean cutting board, spray both sides uh, with a sanitizer solution. You can use one tablespoon of bleach per every gallon of water to make your own, and then wipe nice and dry so it doesn't rust when you store it. Believe it or not, there is a right way and a wrong way to hold a chef's knife. In this illustration, you can see a couple of different wrong ways and a right way to hold this knife. By using the two wrong ways, you do not have control over that knife. And if the knife rolls, it's just going to roll. If by using the what we call the pinch grip on the far right, it will be more controllable and becomes an extension of your arm. Here's an example of how to use the pinch grip. Take your forefinger and your thumb and pinch the blade of the knife toward the handle. Then wrap your other three fingers around the handle itself. This is going to lock the blade into position and it becomes an extension of your arm at that point. Before starting, make sure that your cutting board is stable and not moving around while you chop. An unstable cutting board can be dangerous and you can cut yourself. Put a damp cloth underneath the cutting board to secure it into place. Next, make sure that the foods that you're using are not rolling around on the cutting board. It might be easy to control small things like herbs, 
but larger items like onions, apples, even carrots can roll around on the cutting board, making it dangerous. So to make it easier to cut this carrot, what I want to do is cut one side off, just a small piece, so that it has a flat end. And you can see now it's not rolling around on the cutting board, which is gonna make it a lot safer to cut. First cutting technique I'm gonna show you is the cross chop. I'm gonna start by using the pinch grip to hold the knife, and then with the other hand, place it right on top of the knife. Keeping the tip of the knife down, we're gonna rock back and forth. Using your other hand more as of a guide, you don't wanna apply any weight and cross over your ingredients like I'm doing here with the parsley. And you can start off slow and then slowly speed up and chop over your ingredients. What's great about this cutting technique is that it's very safe. You're keeping your fingers out of the way. It's on top of the knife. So this is a great cutting technique for any sort of rough chops. Perfect for herbs like this. The other cutting technique I'm gonna show you is called the rock chop. We're gonna use a similar pinch grip to hold the knife and a similar rocking motion, just making sure again to keep the tip of the knife down on the cutting board and we're gonna rock with that knife hand. Now with the other hand, what we wanna do is hold the ingredient. We're gonna use our fingertips to face the knife and then slowly curl them in and with that loose thumb, we're gonna tuck it in underneath. Your control hand should resemble a claw, much like this. And with this claw grip, we can actually push the ingredient slowly into the cutting motion of the knife. Now you wanna make sure as you lift the knife that it rests up against your knuckles and never lifts higher. That way you can avoid uh, cutting yourself. And so you're gonna slowly move it into the knife and that's it, perfect. Now the only way you're gonna get better is by practicing those cutting techniques. So make sure that your cutting board and ingredients are stable and that your fingers and especially that thumb is tucked away from the blade or you may lose it. I'm not joking, seriously. By following these simple steps, it's gonna give you a lot more confidence in the kitchen and make cooking and food preparation a lot safer. Let's start where we need to start, at the beginning. These are the basic knife cuts that you're going to learn to execute first, sticks and dice. We start off by planking the food, which is turning it into a long plank that is evenly spaced from end to end. And then we'll turn it on its side and we'll cut sticks out of that plank. From the sticks, we can make the dice. A large dice is made by dicing the food three quarters of an inch by three quarters of an inch by three quarters of an inch. This, by the way, is the exact same size as a die that you would use in a casino. A medium dice is accomplished by dicing it one half by one half by one half inches. A small dice first starts its life as a batonet, which is one quarter by one quarter by approximately two to three inches long, consistency being the key. And then you cut the dice off of that, so you get one quarter by one quarter by one quarter cubes. A julienne, which is one eighth by one eighth by two inches or three inches, depending on how long you want your food to be, can be cut into cubes to get a brunoise. A brunoise is one eighth inch cubed. And then a fine julienne, which is one sixteenth of an inch, is even smaller, and from that we can get a fine brunoise. Here are some of the various different shapes that you'll be able to execute. A batonet, an allumette or a jardinier. This is the same as we talked about earlier, the batonet being one half by one half by two inches long. A julienne, a rough julienne, which is anytime you have a rough or a chopping uh, action, it's going to be used for less refined, uh, possibly even discarded usages. A large dice, medium dice, small dice, and a brunoise. Diagonal or oval slice. Rondelle, which means round. 
chiffonade, a paisan, a rolled cut, which is also known as oblique, tournée, which is turned cut, a split, wedges, crushed, and mirepoix cut. Mirepoix has its own cut because generally it is a rough cut. Some additional cuts you may see, a rondelle, which is often used in environments where you want to have a small amount, uh, particularly carrots if they're smaller, maybe you want to saute them. A mezzaluna, meza meaning half, luna meaning moon, half moons. You can also do a quarter mezzaluna, which is actually, or a quarter luna, which is a quarter of a carrot. A bias cut, which is taking the carrot and cutting along its long axis on an angle. And an oblique, which is also called a rolled cut. Here's an example of how you would accomplish a chiffonade. You would take your leafy greens and stack them on top of each other, roll them up into a nicely tight package, and then slice them fairly thinly. The more delicate the leaf, the thinner you can slice it. This is one of the single most complicated knife skills you would ever execute. This is called a tournée, which in the French term means turned. It is a seven-sided football-shaped turn cut with the ends that are blunted off. It's a very difficult cut, and I will be honest with you, it takes time to master this cut. The easiest way that I found to master this particular cut is to take a hard-boiled egg, sit down on the couch while watching your favorite sports program or TV show, and just practice using that hard-boiled egg as a guide to build the muscle memory in your wrists and in your arms. Fluted is a decorative cut, which is usually done with mushrooms and the like kind of vegetables. In this instance, you can see how the mushrooms are literally scraped on the outside of the surface into this fluted shape, and they also have a little diamond shape cut into the top of it. This is strictly a decorative cut. Gaufret, sometimes referred to as waffle cut, requires the use of a special knife or a special device to be able to accomplish this. This particular knife is a Japanese style knife, which gives us this cut, but you can also use what's called a mandolin, which is a slicing implement that has a guard inside of that, and you literally will take the vegetable and slide it down one way, turn it 90 degrees, and slice it down the other direction. Parisiennes are accomplished by using the Parisienne scoop. This is also sometimes referred to as a melon ball or scoop because it is used whenever making melon balls for decorative presentations. The opposite of dicing is chopping and mincing and pressing. While dicing is meant to be a nice specific shape, chopping, mincing, and pressing are all rough cuts. Chopping is literally just taking the food or vegetable and literally running your knife over it in every direction in many directions until it gets smaller and smaller. Once it gets to a certain point, it is considered chopped. If you take it past that point, it is considered minced. And if you smash it on the cutting board, like in the case of this pureed garlic at the bottom of the screen that was smashed on a cutting board using the blade of a knife, it is called pressed. So to perfectly hold that knife, what you do want to do is grab it and pinch it by the blade using your thumb and your pointer finger. So that means the top of the blade will be pushing into right here on your hand and over time you will develop a callus here because you will be pushing and rocking that knife on to hard or difficult items. It builds up over time. It's totally normal. Don't freak out. You're going to have a callus. Sorry. So once you sort of pinch it, now let's practice cutting. The most important piece outside of even holding the knife is what you're going to do with that other hand that's holding that food. You always want to tuck in your fingertips and then simply practice rocking that knife back and forth. You can do this on a carrot, on any other vegetable, celery, does not matter. Let that cold steel of the blade run on the knuckles of your hand that's holding the food item. Just rock it, just practice rocking. Maybe you're gonna do 10 or 15 carrots just to get comfortable doing this. This is how you slice. 
And now that you've had a ton of practice slicing, let's get into this first one called Brunois, which is a small eighth of an inch cube. A smaller one, which is a sixteenth of an inch cube known as a fine Brunois, or us in the culinary world used to call it a Brunoisette. But you're never going to use that. You may use a Brunois. It's a lot of times used for garnishes and like consomme soups and other things, or just in general, just a garnish you want to spread. which is probably the first or second most dice that I use in all of my cooking. In the exact same way of cutting off the ends, instead this time what we're gonna do is go in a half inch. So once you are to that consistency, again, layer it up, do another half inch, turn it half inch, beautiful medium dice cubes. Practice it, know it, love it, use it. Now on to a large dice, which is oftentimes used in soups, very hearty, very chunky. I actually don't use large dices too often, but we're gonna upgrade to a potato because the carrots aren't wide enough for us to do this. So same thing with the potato that you did with the carrot, knock off the ends to make sure that it sits flat on your cutting board so that it does not rock back and forth. Once you're there, we are going to measure three quarters of an inch wide. You can use your tool, place it over to, to best gauge where you think that is, and then simply slice it, fold it over, give another slice at the three quarter inch, turn it, then get beautiful three quarter inch cubes. And I do have to say that your first time doing this, it's not going to be perfect. This stuff takes practice. I mean, they say in the culinary world, once you've done it a thousand times, you've mastered it. So. You've got a lot of practice to do, my friends, before you start mastering and perfecting a lot of these knife cuts, but you will get it. Start somewhere, start practicing it, start, you know, practice holding that knife, rocking it back and forth. You're going to get it. Okay, a few more knife cuts. And now on to the batonne. What we want to do is make sure um, it is a quarter of an inch by a quarter of an inch by two inches in length. So I'm going to sort of cut off the ends of the potato here. You can use a carrot again. And then just in that same manner, do a quarter of an inch down, turn it, quarter of an inch down, boom, you've got your batonets. These are great little garnishes or just fun ways to cut up vegetables to use. Um, these probably aren't used too often. It's pretty thick, maybe in a salad or on the side served in vegetables. Let's move on to one of the more popular ones, which is julienne, which is an eighth of an inch by an eighth of an inch by two inches in the exact same manner. I'm gonna use a carrot this time. Obviously, once the ends are flattened out, slice it in an eighth of an inch, turn it eighth of an inch, boom, you've got beautiful sort of matchstick carrots. If you're way too lazy to do this, you can get them from the grocery store, but I will judge you. Don't do it, do it yourself. Get the practice, learn how to do it, my friends. 
Okay. So now that you've got your basic knife cut skills, I'm gonna give you a bonus of three more, starting with the rough chop. Here's what a rough chop is. It's whatever you need it to be. This is what goes into stocks or if you're gonna puree up something, it doesn't quite matter what the size or shape of it is. So for potato, I just simply slice across as best I can, turn it, slice it again, I mean, it is not going to be pretty. It's not meant to be pretty. Turn it, slice it again. I got some odd shaped cubes here. That, my friends, is basically what a rough chop is. Let's move on to the next one, which is a fine mince, which I do say often this can be used for garlic or garnish. Like this is what parsley is usually used for in the knife cut that it takes to get there a fine mince. So just folding up the parsley, just rock that knife back and forth, tucking in those fingers. And then once you're here, really just mince away, rocking that knife back and forth uh, from one side to the other, and then from back to front. It's gonna be a beautiful, beautiful little garnish. You can see how finely minced in size they are. Boom, and then the last one, chiffonade. This is really only applied to basil. So pick some basil leaves off. Next, you want to stack them up. Next, simply roll it up and then julienne, that same motion of rocking the knife and you have nice long strips of basil. This is really the only herb that you'll ever do this on. But now that you have these knife cut skills, you need to practice them and you need to practice putting them in recipes. So you're not just throwing away vegetables all day while trying to get the perfect knife cut. So let's summarize and discuss some of our takeaways for today. Takeaway number one, safety, safety, safety. I can't emphasize this enough. It's one of the most important things that we have to deal with when dealing with knives. Knives are dangerous and deadly situations, and if they're not treated respectfully, they can hurt someone. Takeaway number two, never leave your knife in the sink. Always hand wash your knife and make sure to keep it the knife down while walking. Takeaway number three, when holding your knife, use the pinch grip for more control. It will be uncomfortable at first, but you will eventually get used to it. Takeaway number four, to make dice cuts, start with stick cuts first. Takeaway number five, each knife cut serves a purpose, either decorative or for the consistency of cooking, or both. Takeaway number six, practice, practice, practice. It's one of those things that builds up muscle memory over time. The more you do it, the better you will be.